1 Samuel chapter 2, we'll be reading the chapter in its entirety this morning. This is the word of the Lord. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart exults in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides you. Nor is there any rock like our God. Boast no more so very proudly. Do not let arrogance come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and with him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are shattered, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry cease to hunger. Even the barren gives birth to seven, but she who has many children languishes. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he set the world on them. He keeps the feet of his godly ones, but the wicked ones are silenced in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. Those who contend with the Lord will be shattered. Against them he will thunder in the heavens. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth, and he will give strength to his king, and will exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went to his home at Ramah, but the boy ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord and the custom of the priests with the people. When any man was offering a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand. Then he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. Thus they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Also before they burned the fat, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give the priest meat for roasting, as he will not take boiled meat from you, only raw. If the man said to him, they must surely burn the fat first and then take as much as you desire, then he would say, no, but you shall give it to me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Thus the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men despised the offering of the Lord. Now Samuel was ministering before the Lord as a boy wearing a linen ephod. And his mother would make him a little robe and bring it to him from year to year when she would come up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children from this woman in place of the one that she dedicated to the Lord. And they went to their own home. The Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew before the Lord. Now Eli was very old, and he heard all that his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who served at the doorway of the tents of meeting. He said to them, Why do you do such things, the evil things that I hear from all these people? No, my sons, for the report is not good which I hear the Lord's people circulating. If one man sins against another, God will mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father. For the Lord desired to put them to death. Now the boy Samuel was growing in stature and in favor both with the Lord and with men. Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in bondage to Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose them from all the tribes of Israel to be my priests, to go up to my altar and to burn incense, to carry an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the fire offerings of the sons of Israel? Why do you kick at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling, and honor your sons above me by making yourselves fat with the choicest of every offering of my people Israel? Therefore, the Lord God of Israel declares, I did indeed say that your house and the house of your father should walk before me forever, But now the Lord declares, far be it from me, for those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. 
Behold, the days are coming when I will break your strength and the strength of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your house. You will see the distress of my dwelling in spite of all the good that I do for Israel and an old man will not be in your house forever. Yet I will not cut off every man of yours from my altar so that your eyes will fail from weeping and your soul grieve and all the incense of your house will, all the increase of your house will die in the prime of life. This will be the sign to you which will come concerning your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. On the same day, both of them will die. But I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and in my soul. And I will build him an enduring house, and he will walk before my anointed always. Everyone who is left in your house will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver or a loaf of bread and say, please assign me to one of the priest's offices so that I may eat a piece of bread. And may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word this morning. I don't know if this is still the case, but when I worked there, Chick-fil-A had a very generous coupon policy. Case in point, one time I was working and a lady placed her order and she handed me a a crumpled up piece of paper. I unfolded it and it was an old coupon that she had ripped out of a newspaper. But I didn't really know what to do with it for a couple reasons. First of all, a, a third of the coupon was missing because of how she had ripped it out of the paper. Second of all, Uh, The coupon was from Wisconsin. And third of all, the coupon was expired. And it expired in 1982. (laughs) So I went to the back to my boss and I said, hey, I've got this coupon. I don't know what to do with. And uh, I, I said, it's as old as I am. It's not from around here. And I said, the prices on this thing are so weird. I don't even know how to put it in the register if I was to do it. And without even looking at it, my boss said, the Chick-fil-A motto is, honor the coupon no matter what. And she got her entire meal that day for like $2, which is proof that God still does miracles in in our day. You know, as I studied 1 Samuel 2 this week, uh, uh, those words of my boss came back to mind. What did he say? He said, honor it no matter what. This passage in front of us today is asking that question. Who or what do you honor the most? And in this text, we will see very different answers to that question. Did you notice? For most of his life, Eli's motto was, I will honor my sons no matter what. Hophni and Phinehas said that their motto was, we'll honor our desire for food and sex no matter what. And in the midst of all of this, we find a little boy who lived by a very different motto. And his motto was, I am going to honor the Lord no matter what. And my friends, that is the motto that every child of God should adopt and embrace for their lives. You might never get rich honoring God. And you might never get famous honoring God. But mark my words, you will never go wrong honoring God. How do I know that? I know that because there's a promise embedded in this passage. Look at the end of verse 30 when the man of God is speaking, and he says at the end of verse 30, there, sort of in the middle, he says, Now the Lord declares, those who honor me, I will honor. God honors those that honor him. This is the theme of Hannah's prayer. This is the course of little Samuel's life. And this should be the desire of every believer. If you're sitting here today thinking, man, right now I'm having a tough time with my new roommate. 
or I'm having a tough time with, my, with what to do with my finances. I'm, I'm struggling and fighting temptation. I'm having a difficult time in this relationship. Then if you will approach every situation with this commitment that I will honor the Lord no matter what, you won't go wrong. And God will honor those that honor Him. So what does it look like to honor God? And what does it look like to dishonor God? Well, both of these play out in the story of 1 Samuel chapter 2. Notice the first 10 verses here are Hannah's prayer. Now, I'll confess these verses deserve their own sermon, and I'm kind of upset I didn't give more time to this. But to appreciate what's here, let's remember what happened last week briefly. Hannah the wife was Hannah the barren. By God's grace, Hannah the barren became Hannah the pregnant. And in due time, Hannah the pregnant became Hannah the mother. And now in chapter 2, Hannah the mother is Hannah the worshiper. This prayer that we have is an incredible prayer. Now, again, knowing chapter 1, I don't know about you, but I would expect her prayer to say, praise God, I have a baby. Praise God, I finally had a child. But if you notice closely, Hannah's concern was something so much bigger. Her prayer here does not focus on the motherhood of Hannah. It focuses on the sovereignty of God. Notice verse 2. There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. In a day and age when every man did what was right in his own eyes, Hannah pleads with Israel to do something different. She says, let's build our lives on the sure foundation of God. Let's build our choices and build our direction on who God is, a holy, sovereign Lord, because He's the one who's in control. And she gives example upon example of upon example of how this is true. Only God can make the strong weak, and the weak strong. Only God can make the rich poor and the poor rich. Only God can make the barren pregnant and the pregnant barren. Only God can fill the hungry and make the hungry filled. But Hannah, as she confesses these things, which which only God can do, it's very important, important to note that she confesses these things that God does, they're not random. Look at the end of verse 3. She says, and with him, that is with God, actions are weighed. In other words, God is sovereign, but not as some cruel puppet master who is pulling the strings to simply amuse himself. Hannah's prayer reminds us that what we do with God will also determine what God does with us. God is looking at whether our actions will honor Him or whether our actions will dishonor Him. If we speak arrogantly and boast, as she says in verse 2, then we will be silenced. If we take our encouragement and our strength and our might, then God will shatter us. But if we recognize our lowly place before Him and our dependence upon Him, she says, then we will be raised up in due time. So those who fear God will be exalted, and those who live their life not fearing God, God will take note, God will weigh those actions, and they will be brought low. Now, in the rest of this chapter, we get to see Hannah's prayer immediately come to life. Everything that she prays for is going to show up now in a case study between the arrogant and their actions, and the humble, and their actions. There are a series of contrasts, starting with verse 11, between Hannah's son and Eli's sons. And if you'll notice, it's almost like watching a tennis match. We look over here at godly Samuel, and then we have to look over here at ungodly Hophni and Phinehas. And then we go right back to Samuel, and then go right to Hophni and Phinehas. And then we go back to Samuel, And then we go to Hophni and Phinehas. And there is no mistake the author is trying to show us this contrast of good and evil. Of of one that's going to humble himself before God and one that will live arrogantly before God. Those who honor and those who dishonor. 
And so the question of this chapter is, are you going to be on Team Samuel or Team Hophni and Phinehas? Will you honor the Lord or will you dishonor him? Notice where this begins, verse 11. It says, Then Elkanah went to his home at Ramah, but the boy ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. We start with Samuel. We don't have an exact age, but the word boy is usually used of a child, someone under the age of 12. Some kids are math prodigies and some are musical prodigies. Samuel was a spiritual prodigy. Notice he is already, he is only a child, but he has the reputation of a patriarch. This boy is already loving God. This boy is already serving God. This boy is already honoring God. Which is a reminder that age is no indicator of spiritual maturity. You can be six years old and have more godliness than someone who is 86 years old. And and brothers and sisters, this this is a great reminder to all of us that Christianity is not just for grown-ups. Listen, if you're in the room today and you're under the age of 12, boys and girls, listen to me. Jesus died for you and rose again to save you too. And he loves you. And he wants you to know God. And you can have a real relationship with him by believing in Jesus. And you can actually, like Samuel the boy, please God in what you do. When you're at school, in the cafeteria, when you're on the soccer field, when you find yourself doing your chores, ask yourself what Samuel did. What would make God happy right now? Once again, a little child is set before us as an example. As Jesus said, whoever humbles himself as this little child, he is the greatest in the kingdom. An inspiration to every child in this room and a challenge to every adult. Samuel is committed to honoring the Lord no matter what. Now you hear that and think, wow, that's awesome. Man, Shiloh, things are happening. What a great moment at Shiloh. Not so fast. Verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. So we go from Hannah's son to Eli's sons. They are called worthless. There's a play on words in the Hebrew here. It says literally, the sons of Eli were the sons of Belial, or the sons of destruction, or we would say the sons of the devil. They were good for nothing is what it literally means. These men were no longer doing the things they should. Here was men that had a godly heritage and a godly role and a godly responsibility, and a godly task, and yet they have incredibly ungodly hearts. They are spiritual leaders who are actually spiritual imposters. And we know that because the rest of verse 12 says they did not know the Lord. Now, that's not simply they didn't have facts about God. I'm sure they had more theology degrees than most of us in this room do. The point is they they did not walk with the Lord. They didn't know him. Hophni and Phinehas are proof that a man can be involved in full-time ministry and yet still be as lost as lost can be. Divinity students, listen to me closely. One of the greatest tragedies on earth is to spend your time getting a degree in religion and in, in divinity studies and to know Calvin and to know Luther and to know Augustine and to not know Jesus. It's possible. These men are proof. They had a theology, but they did not have an ongoing love, personal relationship with God. And we know that because these men, we know that they did not know God because clearly these men did not fear God. It showed up in their work. Look at what they did in their work, verses 13 through 17. We see there that in the law, God gave the priests a built-in meal plan with the sacrifices. Leviticus chapter 6, you can read it later, said Old Testament priests and their families, this is how they ate. They could take a portion of the meat. But Hophni and Phinehas, they abused the meal plan. They sent their thugs and their their underlings to go and and to, to take whatever they wanted with this giant fork. And it didn't matter if the person who came was a poor person with a tiny pot or they had a giant cauldron. They stabbed it in and took whatever they wanted. 
They were only doing it to satisfy their own appetites. And not only did they take too much of the meat, they took the wrong cuts of the meat. The book of Leviticus is quite clear that the fatty parts were supposed to be taken and burned to the Lord as, a, as an offering to him. When I was in high school, I had an overweight youth pastor who used to say his favorite, his life verse was Leviticus 3.16, which says, quote, the fat belongs to the Lord. How he said it, not me, all right? But the law was clear. The fat belongs to God. But notice in the text, they said, we don't want it boiled off. We want it raw. We want to eat it first. They wanted the tasty, delicious, juicy fat for themselves. Now, why is that a problem? Because, my friends, that belonged to God. It is one thing to cut line in kindergarten. It is another thing to cut in line in front of God. This belonged to him. They were stealing from him. The law was quite clear that we are to honor God with our increase, with whatever we have. If that increase is grain, or that increase is our animals, or that increase is our paycheck, we are to honor the Lord. And to not bring an offering to give to Him and to keep it for yourself as if it belongs to you is to be as guilty as Hophni and Phinehas. It belongs to the Lord. And Hophni and Phinehas decided they were going to keep it for themselves because they wanted it. Their God was their appetite, as the New Testament says. They would do anything to get it. Notice they intimidated people. They threatened people, and they took it by force. And And these men had decided that they were not only going to steal from the people, but they were going to steal from God. They used their spiritual position to satisfy their own desires and that's why verse 17 says thus the sin of the young men was very great before the lord for the men despised the offering of the lord i know this might seem really strong to some of you so this is my own personal opinion but if there is not already There should be a special place in hell for pastors and priests who unrepentantly abuse God's people. It is an abomination. Whether they are exploiting people financially, emotionally, spiritually, or sexually, People say, oh, is this SBC's thing that big of a deal? Yes. Because for a shepherd to abuse the sheep under the auspices of being a holy person is detestable in the sight of God. And just as a reminder to all of our church leaders, elders, deacons, staff, Sunday school teachers, whatever it might be, can I just plead with you to remember at this point The church is not here to serve us. We are here to serve the church. And this is to be our mindset. This is Christ's bride that he has purchased with his own blood. But Hophni and Phinehas were there to serve themselves, to satisfy themselves. At this point, we think, man, maybe things are bad at Shiloh. What a rotten, horrible, terrible place. Well, not so fast. Notice verse 18. Now Samuel was ministering before the Lord as a boy wearing a linen ephod. Do you see the contrast? Do you see the picture here? On the one hand, we have these two brothers who are entitled brats. And on the other hand, we have a small boy trusting a big God. These priests who should know better are despising the Lord and this this elementary student who is serving the Lord. What a picture. And Samuel's growing in his own faith. In fact, there's a really small change in the wording that I want to point out. Look back at verse 11 real quick. It says, the boy ministered to the Lord before Eli. Now skip down to 18. Look what it says here. Now Samuel was ministering before the Lord. See the difference? When he started out, it was God, then Eli, and then Samuel. 
But as time has gone by, he's sort of outgrown that, and now it's the Lord dealing directly with Samuel. And we'll see that more as we get next week into chapter 3. The goal of any internship is to grow into the job for yourself, right? And that's what he's doing. He is growing into this relationship. He, he, he no longer is seeing Yahweh as Eli's God, but now he sees Yahweh as his own God. And my friends, that is a challenge to every one of us in this room, and it's a challenge to one particular group that's here. Those of you who are college freshmen and sophomores, your faith is going to be tested. You've spent years under mom and dad's roof. You've spent years kind of leeching onto their faith. And maybe it's been years, but yours, but now it's really going to be tested. Is it yours? And to the teenagers in our church, your parents' faith may have brought you to Forest Baptist Church, but your parents' faith will not bring you into the kingdom of God. You must be born again, the scripture says. It is not enough to be in a Baptist church, and it's not enough to be in a Christian school. You must be in Christ Jesus yourself. And Samuel is now growing into that and showing up these men who don't know him. As Paul told Timothy, I am convinced that the faith which first dwelt in your mother Lois and your grandmother Eunice, I am convinced that it now dwells in you. Personal faith and a personal God. Not mom and dad's faith, not your youth pastor's faith, not your dorm leader's faith, your faith in him. If the ministry of Hophni and Phinehas had a logo, it was a three-pronged fork. It symbolized intimidating, stabbing, stealing. But if the ministry of Eli had a logo, it was what? It was a simple linen robe, verse 18. A priestly garment. It symbolized purity. It symbolized holiness. It symbolized service to other people. Here Samuel is quietly and faithfully doing his job and his work. I'm sure this boy Samuel saw all the crooked and wicked things that they were doing all around him. But he didn't get sucked into it. Instead, year after year, he kept making his mama proud by making his God proud. She would bring him a robe and she would see his growth and his progress and rejoice in this year after year. But Samuel kept on honoring God, even when those around him were not honoring God. How did he do it? Samuel kept his head down and his nose clean and his eyes on the Lord. And that is a good reminder to all of us. As I was thinking about that this week, it it dawned on me, it's no secret that many of you in this room are employees of Liberty University. And we now know that in recent years, there were some terrible things going on at the highest levels of leadership. And you might have had family and friends who said, how on earth could you work at a place like this when such and such and so forth was going on? Samuel is proof. That you can be a godly person working under self-serving spiritual frauds. And for what it's worth, I spent time talking to many of you over the last few years who have felt angst and frustration and confusion about what you should do and about what you're part of and whether or not this is a good thing or a bad thing. And I am so proud of so many of you who have committed yourself to what Scripture says that you will do your work heartily as for the Lord and not unto men. Honoring the Lord in your classroom, honoring the Lord in your cubicle, I promise you God honors those that honor Him. And if you want a real-time example of God bringing down the arrogance look no further. And if you want a real-time reminder of why every one of us must commit ourselves to honor Him, to humble ourselves before Him, look no further. Samuel is committed to the Lord. We read that and think, whew, that's great news. Maybe, Maybe things aren't so bad at Shiloh. Verse 22, Now Eli was very old, and he heard that all his sons were doing to all Israel and how they lay with the women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. We now discover that Hophni and Phinehas were not just committing priestly sins, 
they were committing sexual sin. They would lay with the women at the tent of meeting. The tabernacle was a busy place. Not only were there Levites working there, but they would often hire young women to be assistants to help with some of the various duties. And Hophni and Phinehas, likely seeing what the pagan nations did with their temple prostitutes, thought this was their opportunity. And so they turned the tabernacle into a brothel. This was their own personal harem. Have we not all heard stories of where the pastor took advantage of the church secretary? There's nothing new under the sun. And yet these men stand as a sobering reminder to every person in this room, whether you're involved in ministry or not, that a desire for sex without a desire for God is a desire that will soon destroy you. This isn't the last time, sadly, that sexual sin will wreak havoc in Israel. If you keep reading 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, into Kings, it destroys David li- David's life, and it will destroy Solomon's life. My friends, listen to me closely. There is nothing more alluring and nothing more tempting and yet nothing more destructive than illicit sex. I have seen men and women destroy their lives and their families for a cheap, quick thrill. And listen to me, there is more to life than dopamine and serotonin. And if you're flirting with it, I beg of you, as Scripture says, flee immorality. Flee immorality. Don't go down that path. But if your desire is that of Hophni and Phinehas, to honor your sexual desires, your sexual urges, no matter what. If that is your mindset that you will dishonor God's word so that you can honor your your own urges, then you need to buckle up. Because scripture says, do not be deceived that neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor homosexuals will inherit the kingdom of God. One of the most culturally acceptable ways right now to dishonor God is to dishonor your own body. And Hophni and Phinehas said, we want our body to rule and reign. These urges are Lord. My friends, just because you desire it doesn't mean you deserve it. And Hophni and Phinehas continued in their sin. Eli hears about this. In fact, the news was circulating through all of of Israel. It was the talk of the town. Now, to his credit, Eli, notice in verse 23, he refers to what they did as evil. And then he confronts them in verses 24 and 25, telling them that they should stop. But the text is written in such a way that it seems to imply a glaring problem with his rebuke. Do do you see the glaring problem? It's verse 22. When did he do this? Now, Eli was, quote, very old. The the passage implies that Eli didn't do this when his kids were younger. He waited until it was a national embarrassment, when it was going to cut off the gravy train of steaks coming his way, as we will soon see. When when he realized that this might be a, a big PR issue, maybe I should go to them. You can almost imagine Eli there at the tent of meeting, sitting in his favorite chair with his arms propped and and, and leaning back and watching Hophni and Phinehas do the foolish things and even the sinful things that they did. And rather than correcting them and rather than disciplining them, he sat back in his chair and laughed and said, (laughs) well, we all know boys will be boys. That is not how you raise godly children. That is how you raise frat boys. And that's what Hophni and Phinehas turned out to be. Moms and dads, listen to me. Can I remind you that the word parent is both a noun and a verb? It requires action. Children should not raise themselves. Why? Because foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Scripture says, he who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves his son will diligently discipline him. And, and to the young people in the room, children, listen, if you have a mom and dad who sometimes tell you no and they punish you for doing wrong, I know it doesn't feel like it, but trust your pastor, you've got great parents. But Eli wouldn't do it. Eli turned a blind eye. 
And Eli was aiding and abetting what happens in their life. And they learned over time they didn't have to listen to what dad said. So verse 25 says they would not listen to the voice of their father, for the Lord desired to put them to death. God weighs our actions. In the Old Testament law, when a son was rebellious towards his parents and did not listen to them, the Old Testament law said the community was supposed to drag them out and stone them. But Israel has so drifted from the law, this almost implies that God said, well, I'll do it myself. And he makes an example out of them. You think, man, that's, that's terrible. Shiloh is a dumpster fire. Not so fast. Verse 26, now the boy Samuel was growing in stature and in favor both with the Lord and with men. Are you seeing the picture yet? Are you seeing Hannah's prayer come to life? We're seeing the arrogant and, and, and the boastful and those who are living by might, who are living for themselves, who are dishonoring the Lord, and very quietly there is Samuel who's living for God, who's honoring God, who's putting God first. Oh, this over here is making all the headlines. This is the top news feed. Everybody's talking about Hophni and Phinehas. And yet quietly there is Samuel being faithful to God. My friends, that's how God works. So often it's in the ordinary faithfulness of his people. He always has a remnant. He's always at work in those who are trusting him. And it might not make the front page, but my friends, it is how God does his work. Samuel has outgrown many of his mother's robes, but he has not outgrown obedience in Christ, in God. He, he has given himself in obedience to God's word, and his reputation gleams. Notice verse 26, he was growing in stature, that is physically, and in favor both with the Lord and with men. By the way, that's not the last time someone will be described that way in the Bible. Does that sound familiar? It should. Luke 2.52, and Jesus kept growing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. When was that said? When he was a boy. He was 12 years old. In fact, he went to the temple and his parents couldn't find him. And they came and they finally found him talking among the, the rabbis and the teachers. And remember what he said to his parents at 12? Did you not know that I had to be about my father's business? Sounds like Samuel. Did you not know that my, my desire is to honor the Lord? Did you not know that I've committed myself to obeying my Father no matter what? And Jesus did. He committed himself to fulfilling everything that his Father told him to do. And that included going to the cross to die for our sins. See, none of us have honored God perfectly. We've all been guilty of Hophni and Phinehas of living for our own stomachs and our own hearts and our own desires, and we've sinned against him. But Jesus came to pay the penalty for our sins. And he committed himself to do God's will perfectly. In fact, one thing Eli told his sons that was right, he says, if a man has a problem with another man, someone can mediate. But if a man has a problem with God, who's going to plead his case in that case? Who's going to step in for that? Who's the go-between to restore a relationship that's broken between God and man? My friends, that is the beauty of the gospel. That is where Jesus comes in. Scripture says there is but one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. If anyone sins, 1 John says, then we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is himself the propitiation, not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. And so when we have sinned against God and we find ourselves in rebellion on the wrong side against God, that's why Jesus came. If you're here this morning and you don't know God, my friends, you can know God right now today by trusting in Jesus Christ, the one and only mediator who has bridged the gap between God and man through his death and resurrection. We can be made right with God. And Samuel is the one who is growing in that role. There's one final scene, verses 27 to the end, a man of God, we don't know who this is, came to Eli. We don't know who he is, but we know what he says, and he blasts Eli. 
He tells him, Eli, you had a special position as a priest. You came of a special tribe, like as a Levite. You came of a special pedigree that is the line of Aaron, the priesthood. You were given special jobs and special privileges and special opportunities, and yet you were given this special promise, but you rejected it. Your actions have been weighed. And Eli, you have not honored God. In fact, if you notice in verse 29, he says, God says, why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I've commanded? And then notice this, and you honor your sons above me. You honor your sons above me. Family is a very good gift from God. But brothers and sisters, let's be reminded, family can be an idol if we let it. In our community, in our culture, we live in a very sort of family-friendly area for the most part, and many people around here will talk about their values, and I praise God for that. But some of them have got their values right, but they've got the order wrong. They'll say, my values are family and country and God. God does not come last. God will not have second place. God is to be first. God is to be honored above all else. In fact, the, 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 to, to put a point on this, um, Eli finds himself in a position as a parent that he sees his grown sons doing what they shouldn't. And God says, are you going to honor him? And there are some of you parents in this room, you're in that position. You're, you're seeing your kids grow up and do things they shouldn't. And you find yourself conflicted because you love and care for them. And in your mind, you're thinking, but I want what's best for them. And yet, I'm loyal to the Lord. Who are you going to honor? Who will you honor first? Eli put his sons first. And he ultimately paid the price. And the result was the house was stripped from him, verse 31. And then verse 34, he said, And your sons, Hophni and Phinehas, on the same day, both of them will die. And stay tuned. It's coming. Why did God say that? Because the Lord weighs the actions of men. The Lord weighed Hophni's actions. The Lord weighed Phineas's actions. The Lord weighed Eli's actions. And the Lord found that each one of them was dishonoring him. They lived their life for themselves. They lived their lives for their own desires. And so God says that he's going to bring the, end, the, the, the line of Eli to an end and he's going to do something else. Verse 35, but I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and in my soul and I will build him an enduring house and he will walk before my anointed always. God says in the midst of this, all this judgment, there's a little glimmer of mercy. God says, I'm not done. I'm going to wipe you guys out, and I'm going to destroy the line of Aaron, but I'm going I'm to raise up a new line. I'm going to raise up a new priest. And in some respects, we are seeing the fall of Eli and the rise of Samuel. But there's a sense in which even Samuel is not the ultimate fulfillment of this. You say, how do you know that? Because, spoiler alert, in chapter 8, we discover that Samuel's own sons do not walk in the ways of the Lord. So his own household does not follow God as they should. And so we are left, even in Samuel, longing for a a priest who actually has a household that is faithful to him, an enduring household. And it's exactly what the case of the book of Hebrews tells us. Hebrews chapter 3 says that Christ Jesus was faithful as a son over his household, whose house we are if we hold fast our confidence in him. God's answer to bad leadership is not no leadership, it's good leadership. And by wiping Eli and his family off and pushing aside the Aaronic priesthood, what does God say? I'm going to send you a better priest, and this priest will never abuse the people. This priest will never commit a sin. This priest will be merciful and faithful. He'll understand every struggle and every trial, and yet he will be faithful in every way. And that is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Eli and his family and those who belong to him, they would perish. But my friends, Jesus Christ and those that belong to him will not perish, but have everlasting life. The ministry of Eli comes to an end. The ministry of Samuel will now begin. Why? Because God honors those that honor him. So brothers and sisters, the question is, what about you? What about you? You and I should honor the Lord no matter what. No matter what your age is, whether you're six or 96, you can honor the Lord. No matter what your job is, Maybe you're the lowly intern who's apprenticed to others, or maybe you're the manager or the boss on top. You can honor the Lord. No matter what your role is, if you're the parent over children, or you're the children under parents, you are to honor the Lord no matter what. If you're the roommate, if you're the the employee, if you're driving, if you're working, if you're talking, the answer and the question is, will you honor the Lord no matter what? I'm doing a wedding this afternoon for a couple in our church. He told me, he said, I probably won't be at church tomorrow. I said, I I imagine you won't be at church tomorrow, but that's all right. I'll I'll see you later in the day. And we were talking, and and, in our premarital counseling, he told me one thing. He said, you know, I think one of the things I had to learn real fast in in an engaged relationship, he said, I was so used to just doing what I wanted. I wasn't very good at checking with her. And he said, I would make plans to go out with my friends, and I'd go, oh, wait, I guess I should, I guess I should tell her. Or, I want to go out and do this for the weekend. Oh, wait, I guess I should, I should talk to her. And he says, man, I had to learn to, to, to realize what this relationship is. My friends, that's a great way to put it. But what does it mean to honor the Lord? It means you don't do anything this week without checking in with the Lord. Is this pleasing to you, God? Is this wise? Is this what your word says? Is, is this going to make you happy? Is this going to bring you glory? Is this going to honor you? Because, Lord, I want to honor you no matter what. I promise you, it may not be easy, but it is always right. God honors those that honor him. And a final word, if you're here this morning, listen to me. You cannot, you cannot honor the Lord unless you first know the Lord. And you can know him today. Jesus stands with his arms wide open inviting you into his kingdom to repent of your sins and to believe on him and to be saved. And he invites you into a real relationship with him that can forever change your life, that you will live in the house of the Lord forever.